Great, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, everybody. Um, so Nick talked a little bit about me. I do want to point out that the links to all of the demos that I'm going to use and some extra reading if you're interested is always down there at the bottom of the screen. It's going to be at kdk2.github.io slash localization. So you can go ahead and take a look at the list of links anytime if you want to. Um, so this happens to me in the US kind of a lot. I finish a build like this in the CSS. I've perfectly established the lovely vertical grid that the designer wanted. All the images align, all the headlines align, all of the call to action buttons align. It's great. It's perfect. Time for a donut. And then I switch into German. <laughs> and it's terrible. The long headlines broke the grid that we had. The buttons, the buttons are terrible. That's, we can't have that. It is not time for a donut. This happens kind of a lot. Even worse, still in English, when we let the content owners go into the content management system and they start changing the text, they move my buttons around again. Honestly, stop it. So probably this build was not so perfect after all, and we're going to have to take care of it. Uh, at Getty Images, we localize our site into over 20 different language and localization versions. So I've kind of learned quite a lot in the past couple years about how to build a site so that it's going to work with a ton of different text around it. Let me stop for a minute just to talk about what exactly is localization. Uh, when Pixar released their Japanese dubbed version of Inside Out, they changed the green peppers from the, or the broccoli from the original version into green peppers because in Japan, green peppers are the universally reviled vegetable for children. Uh, localization can include emotional and cultural changes like this as well as just switching the language over. Localization can also include all of the different changes that you have to have for units of measurement and even the way that very large numbers are formatted. And today what I'm going to be talking about is not the entire localization stack, that's a bigger problem than I can solve in 30 minutes, but I'm going to talk about how to handle all of those changes using CSS, with the results of all of those changes. And, and this isn't just for translated content. Even if you're a small site who doesn't have to worry about going into multiple languages, you probably have content owners and a content management system or perhaps you have user-generated content or content coming from a database. And at the very least, I would urge you to consider respecting the device font sizes when a user with less than stellar vision changes their font size to be a little bit bigger so that your boxes don't break when that happens. OK, cool. So let's first talk about images and embedded uh, text embedded in images. No, don't worry, this is not going to be the last kitten that I'm going to show you today. I know you're concerned. Uh, what we want is we want for the image to be the exact same on every version of our site, but we want the text to change. OK, well, that's not too hard, but um, I don't really want to host 20 different images with 20 different languages embedded in the text, do I? Worse, whenever the text changes, I don't want to make 20 new images in Photoshop. Yuck. So instead, we're going to use our modern CSS skills to let the text be text and the image be an image. Why do we care so much about letting the text be text? Maybe we want a foreign train traveler to be able to buy a train ticket. That would be great. Maybe for SEO. That's kind of important, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, so text should just stay text. That would be better. Languages are often much different sizes. Here we have German, it's three lines long. Uh, German and Spanish are usually much longer than English. Japanese and Hebrew, for example, are often much shorter than English. So we have to worry about making sure that our box is going to be different sizes in both directions. OK, cool. Let, let's start with the markup uh, and, and some pretty simple styles. Throughout, I'm not going to show you the resets. I assume you all already know all about that. In case you haven't seen it before, the figure is a new element with HTML5. 
and it is perfect for containing both an image, just an image tag, and a caption, which is the text that's associated with the image. So it's lovely because we can semantically associate our image and its text together. Double thumbs up, yeah. And then we have some not too exciting styling where we set some sizes and the color on our caption image. The first thing we're gonna do is we're going to want to position the bottom of the fig caption element to the bottom of the figure element. Okay, well we can do that using position absolute, right? Bottom zero, that close. Let's go into position it to the bottom of the containing, of, of the, the, the viewport, the browser window, because it's positioned absolutely for everything. Instead, what we also need to do is to capture the fig caption's positioning context by adding position relative on the parent figure element itself. Thus, we now have the caption at the bottom of the figure element that's been captured. So cool, cool. Next, let's take care of those, let's take care of those pink stripes on the side. That's pretty ugly. The cool thing we can do with this is we can use the CSS uh, intrinsic width module. Now, this is relatively new, so do check the browser support that you use. Earlier, Yuna mentioned can I use .com, and that's a great way to see what's supported. You can also use the no Mozilla Developer Network to get a good idea of whether the thing that you need to use is supported for your browser. Do use a fallback. In this case, I've used max width 400 pixels, and then that's overrided, overwritten by browsers that support it with max width, max content. And what I've set it to be is max content. <laughs> Nick told a joke using, yeah, max content earlier. Uh, what this means is it's going to make the, the parent element's maximum width only as wide as it needs to be to contain all of its children. So this is what gives us this. We don't have those pink stripes anymore. It's just contained by its content, which is pretty sweet. The last thing that we need to do is set a max height and a max width on the image itself so that it can be responsive inside its figure parent. And then we take a look at this in all three different languages that we looked at before. We're like, great, that is the exact same CSS for every language, and it doesn't break no matter which language we're using. That's awesome, that's awesome, good, cool. There are also ways to use different CSS for different languages, and we can, you've probably seen before how to specify the exactly perfect typographic quotes for an element using the quotes declaration inside Q. We can just stick any Unicode. This is the Unicode for fancy pants opening quote. Unicode for a fancy pants closing opening quote. Any Unicode in there will work. And that's great for default if the majority of folks who visit your site are, using, are gonna be reading it in English. But he, in Germany, I'm told that we use different quote marks. Those funny little guys down at the bottom. No problem. On the HTML, we can set a language attribute equal to DE. And now, and normally, you probably want to put the language attribute on your body element, but in this case, just for demos, you can stuff it on any old element you want. Then this is paired with the language pseudo class in the CSS and different Unicode characters for the quote marks. Awesome, great. Same thing for Japanese. We want to have different quote marks, so we just match the JP language attribute for the quote element with a JP pseudo class uh, for the quote elements. And you can just paste the marks in there directly if you don't want to track down their Unicode codes. That works too. I mentioned before that this will work with any set of Unicode or any characters. So what I've done here is I've stolen the language code for Esperanto to make an emoji version of the quote that I was using before. The, the values that are legal inside these attributes come from the ISO 639 language codes, which you can Google for, there's really a lot. And I just stole Esperanto's, which is EO and EO. And so I've decided that for emoji, we're going to open our quotes with donut we're gonna close it with coffee. And that's what we see over here, donut and coffee. So 
So y'all have probably seen text transform before. Uh, and perhaps you know that in the past, there were some problems with the implementations of text transform in browsers. The most recent updates to the CSS text transform module lay out some additional rules which correct problems from previous modules. And that's pretty awesome. For example, one of the problems previously was that if you're using text transform capitalize, which is supposed to capitalize every word in a character, that works pretty good. But right in here, this ideograph for Dutch, both characters are supposed to be capitalized because they're kind of considered to be one character. And that's fixed in the most current version of uh, the CSS3 module. And most browsers support it. Chrome does, super. The most recent version of Firefox also supports another fix. Uh, one of the problems was that in German, the double S character, when it's capitalized, is supposed to be two S's, not the shoes that you've probably seen before. Well, Firefox fixes that. Swell, great, super. But I, uh, Microsoft Edge doesn't quite do that. We've still got shoes hanging out there when it should be two S's instead. Sad face. So some of the updates are available in a lot of browsers, but not all of them are. And in fact, I would encourage you to be really, really cautious with any use of text transform, period. Because it, for me, it strays really, really close to the idea of using CSS, which is for styling, to change the content of a language. For example, you probably saw the Wi-Fi password was in all caps because it looked lovely on the slideshow, but when you type the Wi-Fi password in, it's supposed to be lowercase. So probably just let the content owners, the text writers, write what they mean instead of forcing style changes upon them in the CSS. Probably stay away from that. But if you're thinking about using text transform, if you must, check the specs, because it sort of kind of works better than it used to, and that's what we can expect. Now, let's take a look at headlines, which are a fairly common element that you'll see in a lot of designs. In fact, this is a fairly common design that I get from my designer, where they want the headline to be scooched in a little bit from the containing box for emphasis, because the headline is obviously looking much more interesting if it's scooched in from the rest of the text. And it's got a centered call to action button. Cool. Pretty standard, this should not be hard at all. You would not believe how many slides I actually have on this headline. <laughs> okay, well, the markup's pretty simple. We're just gonna start with a section that'll give us a place to throw our gradient on, and the section's gonna contain a headline. We're gonna put a line break in the headline, and we're gonna have an anchor to be our call to action button. So that's pretty cool, yeah? We're going to affect that big fat margin, margin just by stuffing it on the section element. So we've given a side padding of, uh, we've given a top padding of three rems and a side padding of five rems to scooch everything in. Oh, okay, should be great. Great, yeah, perfect. Time for that donut after all, right? No, no. As soon as we change the window to be a little bit skinnier than before, it starts to look a little odd. And in reality, if you have a responsive site, you're going to see skinnier windows all the time. Also, ugh, that German, it begins to look weird again. OK, we'll, we'll do better. We'll iterate on this headline a little. So instead of just adding a big giant margin to scooch everything in, let's, let's tone that down a little bit. Or sorry, padding. We're gonna change the padding a little bit and make it just three rems and two rems. And then we're gonna give the headline the more specific styling. We're gonna make the headline element 85% of the width, and we're gonna give it margin left auto and margin right auto, which is how we've been centering elements for years. Okay, okay, great. That looks pretty good. Here we are highlighting the element and just showing the padding on the outside. That looks much better. We still have the squeeze effect on the headline. Super. 
In fact, if we think ahead to what the content owners might do, someone might come along and add a paragraph to this element without even telling the poor developers first. And it's still going to look good because we've scooched in the headline itself instead of in trusting that the container is going to take care of the big fat padding for us. God, it still looks a little awkward in German, though. I wish, I wish there was something more to do about Fallenhund hanging out down at the bottom there. Okay, tangent time. Let's talk about widows and orphans. Has anybody heard of the term widows and orphans before? Excellent, excellent. It's these single lines that are cut off from the bottom of their blocks. This line of text down here at the bottom, that's a widow. And this other line of text all alone way up at the top, that's an orphan. You all know that this came from the days of print and typesetting when you would move your little blocks around and then squish ink on it. And in CSS, widow and orphan declarations are supported when using page media. When you're using print media type, you can specify how many lines you want left alone at the end of a page or the top of a new page. And that's awesome. That's cool. You can also do it in columns, sort of, kind of, in some browsers. Um, these declarations in the CSS should mean that the browser will attempt to rebalance all of the text in the columns so that three is the fewest number of lines left alone either at the top or the bottom of any single column. And in browsers where it works, it works great. Currently, it works in Edge 20. That's the current version of Edge. And iOS Safari 8, awesome does not work in the most recent version of Firefox or Chrome or OS X Safari. OK, that's fine, that's fine. A progressive enhancement, it's fine. You can just use it, and uh, that'll be fine. But wouldn't it be great if we could use orphans for something else? Like, go in, imagine for me, this is not real, this doesn't actually work, but imagine that you have a bunch of elements like this, more kittens, which are laid out with Flexbox. And at the end, you've got this one little kitten hanging out all alone. It's sad and lonely, and it's much too long, and it looks weird. What if you could specify an orphan's declaration on the containing elements? Then the browser would stick these two kittens together because we've specified that the minimum number of children to be rendered after a soft line break is two. That would be awesome. That would be much better. Are you hearing me, browser vendors? Orphans for other things, pretty please. Thank you. Oh, OK, yay! <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this thing, so. <laughs> we could also use it to fix our headline. For example, we could declare it would be great if we could say that the minimum number of words things separated by spaces left alone at the bottom of the H1 would be four. And then the browser would just steal some words above and make it balance, just like it does for columns. That would be wonderful if we could do it for our headline. Oh, OK. Oh, great. <laughs> so we can't yet, but maybe someday. It would be great. <laughs> uh, OK, there's one. I told you there were a lot of slides about headline, but we're almost done. There's one more reasonably labor-intensive thing that you can do if you absolutely must to take care of line breaks, uh, to, to handle ugly-looking headlines. In this image, what we have is a yellow line that I drew in there to represent the line break. Remember, in the beginning, I put a hard line break in the markup. We can, compare, we can use this with um, media queries and we can hide the line breaks in certain scenarios. Here, for viewports that are less than 500 pixels wide, we're going to display the line break as normal. That's fine, swell, cool. But for wider viewports, the line break still exists. We're just not going to show it. So if you really must force line breaks into your code or allow your content owners to force line breaks into the content that they're writing, you can absolutely show and hide them using media queries. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's probably the best way right now to handle the ugly headline, but it's pretty labor intensive, so it's your call. The last thing, uh, so I'm, all, I'm gonna go back to talking about the group of boxes because we have some pretty good fixes for that. 
What we want, what the comp says, is that we're going to have three boxes, all side by side. They're all going to be the same height, and they're going to be nicely aligned. The paragraphs are going to start at the same place, and the call to action buttons are going to start at the same place. Now, back in the day, you might have done this with tables, because when you use tables, you get all of that alignment between rows for free. And that's awesome, but this is not tabular data, so we're not going to use tables. It's also going to look pretty terrible when we need a single column view for a mobile kind of browser width. So let's, let's take a look at how we might accomplish this. The markup is, you know, not too exciting. We're going to use a section to contain all three of the boxes, and then inside there, we're going to have a div with a class of group contain each of the columns in there. And each of those contains a headline and a paragraph and a button. Pretty standard, pretty awesome. The styling, we're going to start out pretty simple. At least these days, we get curved corners almost for free. So that's awesome. So we're going to curve the corners with good old border radius. We're going to center some things, add some background colors. Cool, simple stuff. We're going to do a lot of work on the button, but it's not too exciting, really. The most exciting thing on the button is that we're going to give it a width of 60%, and we're going to center it using margin again. And let's talk for a minute about why we can center things using margin auto on the left and margin auto on the right. That's kind of weird. Why does it work? Well, what happens is that the auto declaration takes all of the available space on the side that it's talking about, and then it uses that, and it's OK, that's my space now. And then it divides that between everything that's going to use some of that space. So auto on the left takes half the available space. Auto on the right takes half the available space. And thus, the element, which is no longer 100% of the width, is centered inside its container. So that's, that's my maybe interesting about auto. We'll see. OK, cool. Let's take care of the boxes for each of the groups. To keep them all the same height and side by side, we're going to use our friend Flexbox. Now, again, Flexbox still needs some prefixing in other browsers, so check out Can I Use or the Mozilla Developer Network to see what you need to add to get it to work in your browsers. Flexbox is great because it gives us this auto alignment, it's set to stretch by default. Everything's the same height. All of that comes pretty much for free. The only thing I had to add was display flex on the parent section. So that's awesome. And we're also going to set display flex inside each of these container boxes. Uh, we don't want to use the default direction of rows. Instead, we want the flex direction inside these to be columns. So that's cool. I don't, I don't know. It didn't really make a big difference inside. But what it does do, it sets us up to move all of the buttons to the bottom. And the reason that all of the buttons are at the bottom is that I've set the margin top to be auto. Before, I mentioned that auto takes up all of the available space. In Flexbox, it does that on the top, too. So now all of these buttons just have huge margins, when they can, from the top of their available space. So margin auto within Flexbox scooches everything down to the bottom. All of our buttons are aligned. That's awesome. The only thing we need to do is to get those paragraphs of copy aligned. Ah, how do we do that? They're all within different parents. They don't inherently have any relationship to, them, to each other. So we're going to have to cheat. It's going to be OK. What we're going to do is we're going to steal some of the margin from our H1s. We're going to set that to margin 0, we'll steal that margin. And instead, we're going to tell them that each of these elements has a minimum height of 10 REMs, of 10 REMs. <laughs> um, so instead, this white space is just made up by this element having a height. Now, in cases where the headline contents are actually taller than 10 rems, what's going to happen is it's going to push the paragraph down, and every box is going to have the same bottom line to it. The boxes are still going to be aligned. But the paragraphs won't be, because one paragraph will be pushed down much further by its headline than the other ones. And I think that's OK. 
Because the alternate option, if we were to use just height instead of min height, would mean that for very long uh, H1 elements, we would be cut off at the bottom when the contents don't fit inside the element. So I think it's better to suffer some layout, some layout breakage than to kill content for the users. Wow, so that was a lot of CSS that I just threw at you all. Let's, let's take a look at what we did already today. We looked at how to position a caption at the bottom of its parent using position relative to capture the containing context, and also how to size it based on its parent using max content, which is very awesome. We looked at how to use the language attribute and the same language pseudo class to do any kind of quote marks that you want. And this will allow you to do any styling that you want different for different languages. If it's necessary for your site, you can increase the Chinese text size, but only for Chinese. We talked about how to use text transform, how it's changed with the recent CSS module updates, and how maybe you want to be really, really deliberate and thoughtful before just throwing it on your headlines. We talked about a wish for using orphans and widow declarations in things other than paged media or uh, columns. That would be pretty swell. We talked a lot about how you can corral headlines down to the, the page size. I think that the best standard solution is just to give it a different width and center it. But you can also show and hide the line breaks if you really want to. And we also talked about how can you use Flexbox to magically auto-align a bunch of things inside there. Most interestingly, I think, is the way that top margin auto works. So, of course, you can combine any of these techniques as you need to. I think the important thing to think about is to plan for the text size that you put out there to vary. Because content owners are going to change it, users who up their font size are going to change it, and even if you include any content that's dynamic from a database or from the users or from translations, that's going to change the size of boxes that you need on your website. So just go ahead and plan for it. Um, Building a robust site that survives the localization process is going to be building a site which handles all of these. So that's what I came to talk about. Uh, again, if you want, you can get the links from kdk2.github.io slash localizations, or you can follow me on Twitter or read about my blog, which I swear really is pewpewlaser.com. I've had that for years. I did not make this up. Um, and so there we go. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.